it's been quite a while since I've looked at a tube line that never was, so let's remedy that. Let's talk about the time the central line tried to be the circle line. The central line began as the Central London Railway, which ran from Shepherd's Bush in the west to Bank in the city, and opened in 1900. But even before the line had opened, its promoters were looking to extend. In 1892, they requested authorisation to extend to Liverpool Street. And in 1897, they became involved in a more ambitious project, the City and West End Railway. This was technically an independent project, but with heavy backing from the CLR. The City and West End would run from Hammersmith Broadway to Cannon Street, with intermediate stations at Addison Road, Earls Court Road, Kensington Church, Albert Hall, Knightsbridge, Hyde Park Corner, St James's, Piccadilly Circus, Trafalgar Square, Wellington Street, Law Courts, and Ludgate Circus. The District Railway opposed this bill. They'd been opposed to the Central London Railway from the start, and they didn't like this new scheme any better. They had a plan of their own for a deep-level express line from Mansion House to Earl's Court, and what was more, they were allied with the Brompton and Piccadilly Circus Railway. Both of these new lines would be impacted by the City and West End. Parliament rejected the City and West End bill on the grounds that they weren't sure if another electric railway would be necessary, and an extension of the Central London Railway to Hammersmith would cover most of the territory. The City and West End came back in 1900, but this time it was they who withdrew from Parliament. At the time, the CLR were suffering from technical difficulties. Their trains were hauled by rather heavy locomotives, which caused vibrations that could be felt up on the surface. Given that the City and West End would likely be using CLR-style trains, they decided to hold off until a solution had been found. Actually... The technical difficulties with the locomotives would lead to an even more ambitious plan for the CLR and for the City and West End. In the 1890s, electric trains were a new and quite frightening technology. Their detractors feared that they would cause electrocution and start fires. Originally, the CLR wanted to put a locomotive at each end of the train, but the Board of Trade would not sanction running cables between them. So, one engine at one end, but built to be twice as powerful as originally anticipated. At the end of the line, this locomotive would need to be uncoupled and another one attached at the other end of the train. This took time, so the CLR proposed putting a loop line at each end of the railway so the trains could run right around without uncoupling. And then they changed their mind. Why bother turning around at all? Why not resurrect the old City and West End proposal, then attach it to the Central London Railway at each end? The names of the stations were never actually finalised. I've seen one source that suggests that Trafalgar Square would be called National Gallery, and Hammersmith Broadway would just be Hammersmith, for instance. But I'm working on the basis that unless the geographical location is different, the stations would probably have the same name in the new proposal as the old. The eastern ends of the line would join at Bank, but then they would form a little loop that would include Liverpool Street and St Mary Axe. This was, as you may already have gathered, a time of intense competition between railway companies. The Metropolitan Railway saw this new circle as deliberately competing with their own inner circle line. But the real competition came from a couple of lines that didn't even exist yet. One was the Piccadilly City and North East London Railway, which would run from Southgate to Hammersmith and adopt the more succinct title of the London Suburban Railway. The other was the Brompton and Piccadilly Railway, which of course was allied with the District Railway, as I said. Meanwhile, the Central London Railway had the backing of the main line companies, the London and North Western Railway, the South Eastern and Chatham Railway, and the Great Eastern Railway, plus the City and South London, the first deep-level tube railway. In some ways, this was a battle of the millionaires. If they were billionaires, that would be more pleasantly alliterative, but you can't have everything. J.P. Morgan was the biggest financial backer of the London Suburban Railway. Charles Tyson Yerkes was behind the Brompton and Piccadilly and Lord Rothschild backed the Central London Railway. The argument for the CLR scheme was simple. The CLR had demonstrated that it could run the kind of railway they wanted to build. The expertise was there, much of the equipment was there. These Yankee upstarts had yet to demonstrate that they knew anything about building a tube line. I'm paraphrasing there. I'd imagine they said something to that effect. 
But the London Suburban Railway had an ace up their sleeve and the clue was in the name. They were going to the suburbs. The Central London wasn't going much beyond Central London. Parliament saw the London Suburban as having greater social value, so that's what they went for, and the Central London Bill was defeated. The CLR resubmitted in 1903, but it got postponed. Then they proposed it again in 1905, but withdrew it. Meanwhile, Yerkes had bought one of the constituents of the London Suburban Railway out and caused that to collapse, and the end result was the Piccadilly Line. The Central London Railway did not try again. They struck a truce with the Yerkes lot, agreeing that neither would build another line from east to west. The introduction of multiple units with cabs at each end meant the CLR didn't need loops anymore. And that's where the whole thing ended. I find the scheme as a whole very interesting. It feels in some ways like a power move. They knew they were in competition with other companies, and they surely knew those companies would object. Perhaps it would have been a success, or perhaps it would have fallen into the same difficulties that the Circle Line had before it stopped being a circle. Maybe we wouldn't have had a Piccadilly line at all, but who knows. Well, I hope you enjoyed this loopy tale from the tube. If so, please do click the like button and consider subscribing for more. I would like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon for your generous support. You are the loop line to my locomotive. And I'll see you all again very soon for another tale from the tube.